of you are familiar with the term New Age Movement? Well, good. You must be doing a good job, Brent. Uh, I, I think what I'd like to do is just define it anyway, explain a little bit about how I got involved in it, and then describe how this false Christ has... It, a lot of people think, you know, many false Christs are coming. Um, we have one false Christ, Antichrist, who is on the world scene. And as a matter of fact, uh, Chuck Smith wrote a book back in 1976 called The Soon-to-Be-Revealed Antichrist. Uh, on the front cover, it says, The stage is being set. The world and the minds of men are being conditioned for a leader, one who can establish peace and safety in these perplexing times. The Bible predicts these events and describes this man of solutions whose number is 666. I remember when I got out of the Army years ago, lost and confused, uh, went out to California to find myself, and when I did, I knew I was really in trouble. Uh, I went to the Ghirardelli Chocolate Factory in San Francisco. I don't know if any of you have been there. It's a, sort of a landmark place to visit in San Francisco. They have these really great ice cream sundaes, and they give you a number. And so they gave us our number, and we sat and waited. And uh, they were calling out the numbers, and all of a sudden we heard, 666. <laughs> and this, this voice said, yes. <laughs> And he, he kind of wandered and wavered up to the counter. And everybody sort of, it wasn't like the laughter that you just did. It was more of a nervous titter. Because, and you know, I don't even know if that would even raise anybody's attention these days. That was a long time ago. I, I don't know if a lot of people even know what 666 represents. But uh, Brent and I thought it was interesting that, you know, I've landed here uh, right at Revelation 13, where you're talking about the Antichrist, and pretty much... I was involved with uh, of bringing this false Christ onto the world scene through the teachings that I was involved in and that I was bringing to people in my community. Let me just stick this stuff down here. How does a false Christ make his way into the world and into the church? Well, uh, there was a movie with uh, Bill Murray years ago called What About Bob or Whatever Happened to Bob, something like that. And this guy is really um, pretty confused. And he's seeing a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist tells him to take baby steps. So you see Bill Murray down on the street in whatever city that was, walking along going, baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. This thing has been incremental. It's just been coming on slowly but surely. And it's interesting that Chuck wrote his book in 1976, because in 1975, that was the year that a lot of New Age teachings were unleashed uh, on the world. Um, some of the ones that I got involved in shortly thereafter that. But the New Age movement, I just want to keep it really simple. In 2 Corinthians 11, 4 and 5, we're warned by the Apostle Paul about another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. And he prefaces that by saying there's a simplicity in Christ. And there is. The Apostle Paul said, all I know, I'm determined to know is Christ and Christ crucified. Everything happened on the cross. That's everything the devil's trying to do to change things. If he can take the Lord off the cross and everything that happened on the cross, then he can institute a new world religion. But they're not calling it new world religion anymore. They're calling it a new world view, a new spirituality. It's a lot tamer, kinder, gentler, easier for people to take in, a new world view. But it's really the new age. And it's a new spirituality. So there's a simplicity in Christ, and there's a simplicity in the deception. You don't, I, I, at the conference, I, I know some people were furiously writing down names, and we tried to keep it simple. Uh, the playing field has gotten pretty big. Uh, it used to be you could isolate a false teaching or a false teacher fairly easily and warn people. Now there are so many that you can't keep up with them, and I wouldn't advise trying. But you do want to have uh, an understanding of some of the major deceptions that are going on today. And I hope I'll be able to cover a book that I think is particularly difficult. Uh, hope I don't step on anybody's toes here, but uh, in 31 years as a Christian, I think the book Jesus Calling is probably the most dangerous thing I've seen enter the church. And that probably sounds kind of strange to anybody here that might be reading it. But there's a lot that's involved in that book that a lot of people would, would miss. And 
the way that the, the things are coming in are through channeled voices from the spirit world in the name of Jesus. We are told in 1 Timothy 4.1, the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. That's exactly what happened to me. Uh, I wrote a book called The Light That Was Dark from the New Age to Amazing Grace. This isn't the, the place to do the whole testimony. But basically, I got involved in the New Age because I was fascinated with a downtown waitress in Northern California. That's how noble my spiritual search was. <laughs> Typical guy. I had her over to my house for dinner, and in the course of the evening's conversation, she said, would you be interested in seeing a friend of a friend of mine who's a psychic from Canada? So it's all your fault that I got involved <laughs> in the New Age. <laughs> and, and being from the East Coast, I'm from Connecticut originally, uh, I was hesitant, and I, you know, I didn't really want to have anything to do with psychics, but I wanted to have everything to do with this waitress, so I said, well, sure. So I got the psychic reading from this gal, and she was telling me all these things about myself she had no business knowing, and she got my attention. It's just like, you know, the, uh, you, you're probably aware of in Acts 16, Paul and Silas were thrown into the, the jail there, and the Philippian jailer and his whole household got saved because a psychic was put out of business. And the psychic was put out of business when Paul confronted her and cast out the spirit of divination. It wasn't like she had some great gift. She had a spirit of divination. And that's what we're dealing with in the world today. People are channeling spirits. People think that psychics have gifts. No, they've got spirits. Spirits know what's going on. Spirits can see what's happening there and then tell somebody else and then give you a reading. So she's got my attention. And then towards the end of the reading, there was a, a whirling sensation over my head that was really strange. Never, it was just like a tingling. And I'm going, what is going on? And without my saying anything to her, she said, are you aware that there's a ball of light over your head right now. And I said, I don't know what it is, but I can feel there's something up there. What's it doing there? And she said, you have a lot of help on the other side. And I said, well, what's the other side? And she said, loved ones that have passed on, angels, spirits that are interested in your well-being. Well, I thought that was pretty neat. And she'd already told me that I was very underdeveloped spiritually, and that was true. And I needed to do something about my spiritual life. So I asked her, I said, well, how do you do this? And she said, you have to give them permission. So on the flat roof of my house in a canyon in Northern California that night, I said, you on the other side, I want to be more spiritual. I want to grow. Come into my life, please. And if you will recognize that, it's a reverse sinner's prayer. I just opened a huge door. But did you also notice I was really sincere? It wasn't like I was into darkness. You know, I mean, I, I was moving into it and didn't know it. But I was sincere, and I thought that I was dealing with God. Why? Because I didn't have any real knowledge of the Bible. I had very little. And I've noticed that with a lot of Christians that are getting involved with some of these things that are very popular, they do, they're not that <laughs> grounded in Scripture, or they haven't taken the warnings in Scripture that seriously. So my life took off like a rocket ship because I had just opened the door. And we were talking about this this morning a little bit where, you know, can Christians really be deceived? I mean, doesn't Jesus protect them? Well, sure, he protects us if we know his word, if we're calling upon him for protection. But if we just charge into some of these books like The Shack, or we're reading a, a paraphrase, supposed paraphrase like The Message or something like that, we're walking into dangerous territory because it's a mixture of truth and error. Let me just read to you just for a second here. For those, there are people, and one of the things that's being put out in the church is like, hey, we just want to be into love, peace, and happiness. We don't want to be negative. Can't we just praise the Lord? We want to be known what we're for, not what we're against. Well, if you read the Bible carefully, God is for discernment. He wouldn't issue so many warnings to us about things that can deceive us if he didn't want us to be alert and watchful. This is Harry Ironside. He's a fundamentalist pastor, author, at Moody Church in uh, Chicago back 1930, 1948. But just, I'm just going to read a little bit of this. I would recommend going online, downloading this. It's easy to find. It's called Exposing Error, Is It Worthwhile? Harry Ironside. He says, Objection is often raised by some sound in the faith regarding the exposure of error as being entirely negative and of no real edification. Of late, the hue and cry has been against any and all negative teaching. But the brethren who assume this attitude forget that a large part of the New Testament, 
both of the teaching of our blessed Lord himself and the writings of the apostles is made up of this very character of ministry, namely showing the satanic origin and therefore the unsettling results of the propagation of erroneous systems, which Peter in his second epistle so definitely refers to as damnable heresies. Then he says, error is like leaven, of which we read a little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. Truth, this is really important, truth mixed with error is equivalent to all error, except that it's more innocent looking and therefore more dangerous. God hates such a mixture. Any error or any truth and error mixture calls for definite exposure and repudiation to condone such as to be unfaithful to God and his word and is treacherous to imperiled souls for whom Christ died. In Ephesians uh, 5, uh, around 10 to 15, um, we're told by the Apostle Paul, it's a, shame we have to, it's a shame we have to take time on a Sunday morning. You guys, you're having a good time here. You guys enjoy fellowship. It was, it was pretty interesting. I'm sitting there going, okay, false Christ, and you guys are going, yeah, yes, all this fellowship going on. But we need to be rejoicing in the midst of this, but we also need to be aware of what's going on. So the bottom line, the, the leaven, if you will, that's going to change everything. Have you noticed this phrase that's leached its way into our national vocabulary or international vocabulary, particularly strong in the last three or four years, game changer, game changer. I'm seeing it everywhere down in the States. I'm assuming it's up here too. A game changer is usually a sports term for, you know, when somebody hits a key basket in the end of the game that keeps the, you know, their, or makes their team uh, win the game, or a, 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 I guess a better example would be when somebody scores a, a goal, or like unfortunately yesterday when they didn't score a goal, uh, that was a game changer when that gal missed the goal. I, I'm, she, I'm sorry about that. She must feel terrible. But it's a game changer. And the game changer, the leaven, that can change everything is simply this. And it's, it's a lie. It's the lie, I believe. God is in everyone and everything. Everything is divine. The best way to explain this would be, from their perspective, is that all of the world is the body of God. All of the world is the body of Christ. Every person is a cell in the body of God in the body of Christ. Now, you know this isn't true, but this is what's coming across, and it's coming into the church. Every cell, being a part of God, has to fulfill its function. When I hear the term spiritual formation, I find it's kind of interesting because everybody needs to get in formation. Like when I was in the army, we would have to fall out and get into formation. If a person who is supposed to be a divine cell in the body of God does not fulfill that function by denying that all is God, then that cell is regarded as cancerous, as, um, as a renegade. And what the New Age... Christ and God is saying, channeling through people, he's saying that that cell, which would be those of us who refuse to believe that everything is divine, needs to be healed or eliminated. I'm not trying to be a downer on Sunday morning, but the writings, and I wish I had copies of my book, False Christ Coming, Does Anybody Care? But they all went in the conference. But we have in writing from the New Age authors the same kind of serious foreboding events that Hitler had in Mein Kampf, and Germany did not pay attention. And right now, the church is not paying attention, and part of the reason is that most of our major Christian leaders are more interested in revival than in warning about the danger that's coming in. This may sound weird, but I really believe that there's a false revival coming, and that it's going to be a distraction from exposing that things that are going on right now that are taking people into false teachings like this. There's so many ways we could go with this, and I don't want to you know, bring in everything that's going to just confuse you. But if you can just uh, imagine this um, example of a Christmas tree, like at the, uh, in our case in the States, in the White House, they have this huge Christmas tree, and the president goes out there, and there's this big to-do, and, and then he throws the switch, and the whole tree lights up. When I was a kid... If one bulb in our Christmas tree didn't work, it shorted the whole tree. That's how those of us who deny humanity's divinity are going to be regarded. And that will be the means by which they will rationalize dealing with us on a severe level. Because our energy 
is, is getting you know, rerouted and not into the body of God, into the body of Christ. Now, to bring this into focus, so that this doesn't sound like some abstract concept, and it's like, well, okay. In 1992, I was editing my book for Moody Press, The Light That Was Dark, From the New Age to Amazing Grace. As I was editing that book, warning people about a set of teachings called A Course in Miracles. How many have heard of The Course in Miracles? Okay, not too many. Let me explain what The Course in Miracles is. This is what I got involved in. This was at the height of my New Age journey. Everything that I did, the gurus, the psychics, the channelers, everything led to this set of teachings called A Course in Miracles. A Course in Miracles is reputedly new revelation from Jesus Christ himself channeled through a, a Columbia University professor. Sounds crazy. Dr. Oz is at Columbia University, and he's an occult teacher, and most people don't know that, and he's involved with Rick Warren and the Daniel Plan. There's so many things going on. She heard a voice. This is A Course of Miracles. Please take notes. For seven years, she took down the spiritual dictation from, quote, unquote, Jesus Christ. What did this Jesus Christ say? He said, the journey to the cross should be the last useless journey. Do not make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. A slain Christ has no meaning. Now, does this sound like Shirley MacLaine and like, ooh, I'm God? No, this sounds like the voice and the breath of Antichrist. This is serious stuff. 1992. Oprah Winfrey had a woman by the name of Mary Ann Williamson on her program. As I was starting to warn with my little Christian book, watch out for the Course in Miracles, Oprah Winfrey went on television and had Mary Ann Williamson, her book, Mary Ann's book was A Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of a Course in Miracles. Oprah Winfrey used that program and that introduction to that set of teachings to scare people, and then to offer them A Course in Miracles as a solution to the world's problems. Let me reframe that. I'm going to show a clip. I'm going to show the exact clip that she did on her program. And it's really important for you to see, this is 1992. Oprah's been doing this for years. She, I, the first that I'm aware of for really outing the New Age was in 1987. What's that? 13, 15, 28 years this has been going on. Very few Christian leaders are warning about this. It's almost as if, I mean, you know, if you're in the inner city, like in San Francisco or New York City, and you've got inner city kids playing basketball, and somebody says something about somebody's mother that isn't really good, do they just go, oh, you know, whatever, you know? No, they go, what are you saying about my mother? You know, they get into... These things are being said about our Lord and Savior, and we're not hearing anything at a higher level of leadership. That really is kind of indicative of how far this thing has gotten 1 Corinthians 14.8, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? A great way to let deception in from the devil's standpoint is to have Christian leaders who are not warning about what's coming in. You just kind of let it, let it come in. And then before you know it, you've got all this stuff going on. You've got books like The Shack, Jesus Calling, they're just there. So I'm going to have, have this clip shown, but I want to just set it up, and, and, and this is really clever. Oprah starts off by scaring everybody with how bad things are in the world. Uh, when I was a kid, in the old westerns, the bad guy would shoot at the good guy's feet and say, dance. And while he was dancing, the good guy was told what he had to do to keep the guy from shooting at his feet. And I believe that's part of what's happening. We've seen it unfold this weekend, where it's getting pretty wild on all the counts. And if we all get scared enough, well, what, what can we do? What can we do? Well, we need to come together as one. We need to be unified. Okay, well, we can come together as one, but what are the conditions? We need to realize that we're all God. Wait a minute. No, wait a second. That's not true. Well, yes, it is. We're all divine because a lot of the world's accepting it because this stuff's been going on for years. I've had many a, a ride from the airport where I'll try to explain to the driver about, I'll say, you know, this saying that, you know, God's in everybody. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, God's in everybody. Before I can even warn him, he's just, it's almost part of his mindset. So 
The other thing you want to notice is as she's using these different clips to scare people, and there's a clip from the movie Grand Canyon with Danny Glover. Um, listen in the background and you'll hear John Lennon, just little parts of When the World Will Be as One from his song Imagine. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. One being, you know, the saying, you know, it's all good. The next step after that is it's all God. All you have to do is cross out one of the O's. God is good, all is good, all is God. Well, no, wait a second, no, that's, that, you're going too far there. And it's not all good anyway. So then, setting that up, she introduces Marianne Williamson, whose book, A Return to Love, is all about the principles of A Course in Miracles. And Oprah says, I believe the teachings of A Course in Miracles can change the world. Millions of copies of this book have been sold. Oprah is hugely, hugely influential in getting these books out there. Slain Christ has no meaning. Uh, no atonement. It's at one meant. Everything's one. That's the New Age interpretation of it, at one minute. There's no sin. There's no devil. But the Course in Miracles is filled with Christian language. It threw me when I first picked it up. I went, wait a minute. You know, I went to the counter of the bookstore. I said, I was led to believe that this is really like good teachings, but it's filled with Christian terminology. You know, do you know anything about this Course in Miracles? And the young guy at the counter goes, oh, yeah. He says, I've been doing it for 16 months. It's changed my life. I said, oh, okay, I'll buy it. Came 50 bucks. That's the way it goes. So there's no sin, no devil, uh, no evil. Um, the Christ of A Course in Miracles says, those who oppose me are anti-Christ. That's us. Those who do not subscribe to his teachings. Now, in, night, or in 2001, I wrote the book, False Christ Coming, Does Anybody Care? And what I realized as I was putting that book together is that The Course in Miracles, Jesus, Conversations with God, Neil Donald Walsh was number one on the New York Times bestseller list for a couple of years. All of the New Age teachers that are channeling Christ and God, they're all saying the same thing. We don't have a million different Christs and a million different... It's coordinated the foundational teaching, the leaven that can change everything. The game changer is God in everyone and everything. I gave a talk on this um, at the conference... Uh, I'm sure you can get a copy of it if you want. I, just, I, I went through how this teaching has entered the world through books like God Calling, Jesus Calling, Glenn Beck, The Shack, other worldly things like, you know, uh, Norman Vincent Peale's uh, Power of Positive Thinking, Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life, uh, The Secret. It just documents how this has come in over the last, you know, 40 years or so. So Oprah says in this thing, the teachings of A Course in Miracles can change the world. You better believe they will and can if they're put into effect, if we don't have some understanding. Now, but I love Jesus. Well, the guys in the inner city love their mother, and they defend her when, they, when she's redefined and reinvented and reimagined and everything else. I'm hearing almost nothing from Christian leadership about the blasphemy that's going on. And again, we come back to Chuck. 1976, the world is being conditioned for Antichrist. And ironically, I found Chuck's book. I'd never seen it before. It was being thrown out at a church that felt that, you know, well, that's kind of passe, you know. And I picked it up and I went, whoa, you know, that's pretty interesting. And Chuck cared enough about this stuff to, to take an ex-New Ager and have me come and speak to the conference where Brent was at back in 2008. He wanted the church to be warned. Chuck did not want the purpose-driven life in Calvary Chapel bookstore. Rick Warren didn't like that too much. His apologists came at me and, I mean, they didn't come at Chuck because that, that would have been a big mistake on their part. What it was was, we really love Chuck Smith, but he's had a senior moment having Warren Smith come and speak at the pastor's conference. And by the way, and then the apologists went online and said, Warren Smith is a traumatized ex-New Ager with a paranoid mindset. And he had links to books on paranoia in case you think Rick Warren's a really nice guy. I mean, I'm sure he is in some ways, but when it comes to this stuff, he has an agenda, and he's not warning people, and he's taking people into this very deception. So Oprah hypes this book, and you watch the way she uses her influence, and hopefully it'll, it'll play okay. And just look at the, the, the way that uh, John Lennon's song is weaved in, how people are scared, and she comes in, and she just goes, you know, things are bad, 
and we need, we need something that works. So if you want to go ahead and roll that. Keeping your sanity because it looks like the world has gone just crazy. When you talk to your family and friends, do they say that they feel some of this craziness too? Two things inspired me to do this show today. The movie Grand Canyon and a new book that you're going to hear about, hear a lot about. You're going to get answers today if you want them in this hour. If you've gotten to the point of feeling that everything, your time and your safety and your children's safety and your relationships and your work have been snatched out of your control and we are a nation of people going crazy, confused human beings, please sit down and listen. This is the way it is. Traffic there remains very heavy getting away from the Long Beach interchange as you head out. The Columbus Crash is back up right back to the toll plaza. Kristen was abandoned this weekend, about two days after she was born. I'm in here for rape one and sodomy one. Um, I started when I was 10. And I think we're all raising Jeffrey Dahmers. The bullet went through a window and struck LaToya in the head. Do you see peace? Have you ever seen peace in this country? Because a whole lot of people are dying for peace and peace like you for nobody. You want chaos. Yeah, if I get killed, I'd just one nigga go. One nigga go. Her attacker was her daughter-in-law. She went on your name, got the butcher knife, she's gonna kill. The worst is yet to come. They then burn me, they stab me, they rape me. Who's gonna pay our bills? Who's gonna take care of us until I find another job? I have no one to rely on. You I was so blind because I was working midnight, going to school during the day. Are you asking me a favor as a sign of respect? Or are you asking me a favor because I got the gun? Man, the world ain't supposed to work like this. I mean, maybe you don't know that, but this ain't the way it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to be able to do my job without asking you if I can. That dude is supposed to be able to wait with his car without you ripping him off. Everything's supposed to be different than what it is. It's supposed to be, but what's gone wrong? My guest today is Marianne Williamson. Many of you know who she is because thousands of people every week, poor people and rich people and lots of celebrities, go to hear Marianne Williamson speak in Los Angeles and also in New York City. And what she talks about is based on a set of books. Many of you have heard about them called A Course in Miracles. Marianne has become a teacher a leader in the philosophy that uh, I personally know could change the world. I believe that in my heart. And she has now written her own book. The book is called A Return to Love. Now let me just say this, that every day I have guests on this show, and I'd say at least three out of five times during the week, those guests come on the show with a book. I've read many books over the years. I have never been as moved by a book as I have by Marianne Williamson's book called A Return to Love. So moved, in fact, that I went out and bought a thousand copies. And uh, we'll be giving you all a copy before you leave here today. But... I, 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 I really do believe that the message in the book, Return to Love, is, is what we all need so much in our lives. And that's why I cannot, if it sounds like I'm trying to hype the book, I really am. Because I believe that it's so, so important. And for the first time, you can open a book and actually see some answers. So I, I first of all, I, I feel blessed that you're here oh, and you. that you came to write the book. You can actually see some answers. A return to love. A slain Christ has no meaning. The journey to the cross is the last useless journey. It's all covered in love. It's all covered in the name of Jesus. Paul warned that there will be, a, he chided the Corinthians, that, that there could be another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit that they just might go for. Well, it's happening. 
It's happening on a wide scale. Now, The Course in Miracles has not entered the mainstream church, but the shack did. The shack's Jesus said, God who dwells in and around, God who is the ground of all being dwells in and around all things. That's the very same teaching that's documented in that. There's a, a booklet that I did that was, uh, came out like three or four days ago on Lighthouse Trails. You can go to Lighthouse Trails and you can download the whole booklet that has all this stuff in it. And I've got the shacks in there and I've got others. You've also got the Jesus of Jesus Calling on page 199 saying, I am above all as well as in all. This is what you want to be on the lookout for. The divinization of humanity, the divinization of the earth. And with Earth Day and all that stuff, that's well on its way. That's the game changer. That's, that's what is coming at everybody. Do you see how manipulative that was? Now, Oprah, I'm sure, really believes, just as I did when I was doing The Course in Miracles, that it really can change the world. Because on paper, you know, we all come together as one. You know, let's just not have a divisive doctrine uh, and, and belief like Jesus dying on the cross for your sins. If we can just get him off the cross, and if we can just join hands, so we can all sing Kumbaya, and we can, we can have world peace. Rick Warren has a peace plan. Well, he hasn't really defined it, but the New Age has a peace plan. Antichrist has a peace plan. In Daniel 8, 24, 25, it says that Antichrist will destroy wonderfully. What is she doing right there? It looks wonderful. What did Jeremiah say in Jeremiah 5, 30, 31? He said, a wonderful and a horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and my people love to have it so. It's exactly what Oprah's doing. I don't doubt her motives, but she's one of the most dangerous false prophets that are out there because she's so believable, and she's doing so many good things on other levels. No doubt. Little leaven leavens the whole lump. In uh, Daniel uh, 11, it talks about how the robbers of the people exalt themselves. And I, I don't know, I just look at that and I go, can you exalt yourself any more than I am God? We're being told by New Age teachers that we need to leave our ego and we need to awaken, another crossover term, to the God within. Leave the ego and go to the God within. That's like the biggest ego trip of all, that you think you're God. I mean, you've you got to pierce the language here, and you've got to be able to know just enough so that people that are enthralled with some of these things that are coming into the church, like I, I wrote a book called Another Jesus Calling because I was going to a conference actually up in La Crete, up in northern Alberta. I had all my talks prepared, and just maybe a couple days before I left, um, one of the gals at the conference called and said, hey, what do you know about the book Jesus Calling? I said, not much. I, I, it's not good. I've seen it you know, at Costco and whatever your equivalent is. I don't know, do you have Costco here? Yeah, it just piled high. She says, could you look into it and maybe you know, talk about it a little bit? And I said, sure. So I go down to the local Christian bookstore. I couldn't believe it. It was like piled this high on the floor. If you go into some Christian bookstores now, there's a Sarah Young section. Like, there used to be a prophecy section. That's gone. Now there's a Sarah Young section. She's got, like, ten different versions of Jesus Calling, different colors, pink for women, I guess. Maybe for with the new, you know, way things are, whatever. <laughs> whatever. So there's, there's leather bound. There's, there's one for kids, for tots. There's, there's one for teenagers. It's, it's, a, it's a cash cow for Thomas Nelson and Sarah Young. If it's the truth, fine, you know. No problem. So I turned to the clerk and I said, how many of these have you sold? He said, thousands, thousands. So I started reading the book in the bookstore and I went, oh. I mean, I started spotting stuff like right away that just grabbed my attention. First thing that I saw, by the way, how many of you either have been reading Jesus Calling, have had Jesus Calling given to you, know somebody who's reading Jesus Calling or aware of the book Jesus Calling? Not that many. Okay, let me reframe this. It's been out for 10 years. It's doubled in sales every year. It's the number one best-selling Christian book. So, you know, I appreciate it when pastors like Brent have me come to kind of fill in some of these things that there's no way that he can keep track of all these things that are going on. But part of our job 
is, is kind of watching out for the body, is to let you know you need to be aware of this book because what are you going to do if somebody, you know, your Aunt Mary sends you a copy for Christmas this year? Oh, well, I heard it was a bad book. Aunt Mary, it's a bad book. That doesn't work. People love this book. It sold 10 to 12 million copies and is going strong as we speak. So you need to be aware of it. It's also an incredible way to warn people about what's coming into the church. If you have enough understanding to communicate and converse with the people that are reading it and to ask good questions. And we've got two booklets. Uh, I've got two booklets that I, I published also through uh, Lighthouse Trails. One is called Changing Jesus Calling, Damage Control for a False Christ. The other one is the New Age Implications of Jesus Calling. You can, you can go home and you can just download those and just read. You know, I've got things summarized. Or you can get the book. And ideally, if you know somebody that's reading the book, you know, give them this book. So I, last night, a couple of women came up at the end of the conference and said, we're reading Jesus Calling. We heard something like it isn't any good. Can you tell us about it? And I talked to them for about 10 or 15 minutes. So the first thing that I noticed about Jesus Calling, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because it needs, you know, we are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices, especially when it's bringing in the very conditioning that Chuck warned about back in 1976 that I was involved in for a number of years. First thing I read was that the author, Sarah Young, is a graduate of Wellesley University, a top flight school on the East Coast. Uh, her husband has been a missionary. It all sounds real credible. Hey, she's a missionary's wife, went to Wellesley. Um, you know, must be a good book because uh, I was told by my neighbor who's been a Christian for 20 years that it's a good book. No, you need to read these books carefully and look for things that conflict with Scripture. First thing that she said in her book was, I was inspired to write this book when I read the book God Calling. And I went, whoops. I had that book when I was in the New Age. It's a New Age book. In that book, the Christ of God calling says that he is in everyone and he's in everyone's soul. I told my wife, I said, you know, because I, when I looked through all this stuff and then, and, and then went up to the conference and came home, I knew I had to write a book. I told my wife, I said, you know, so an ex-New Ager says that, you know, God Calling's a, a New Age book. You know, people are going to go, oh, you know, he sees the new age everywhere. And by the way, I do. <laughs> it's, it's no kidding. So I went down to my garage, and I just happened to look over at this bookshelf that I had. And we have library book sales, and we pick up all sorts of stuff. And I never really looked at it, but it was the Encyclopedia of New Age Beliefs, published by Christian publisher Harvest House. The book was edited and compiled by John Ankerberg, who's had a show on TV as an apologist for years, and John Weldon, another apologist. In the chapter on channeling demonic spirits, they did an extensive review of the channeled New Age book, God Calling. So when my book came out, uh, all of a sudden there was some new editions of Jesus Calling. Guess what was missing from the introduction? No references to God Calling. Gone. Just like the, the 18 and a half minutes in Richard Nixon's Watergate tapes. Gone. No explanation. No apology. Nothing. A secular blog, the Daily Beast, which was originally associated with Newsweek magazine, somehow got in touch with me and said they were doing a story on Jesus Calling. And when they published their article, which you can find online, I think it's called The Saga of the Evangelical Bestseller That You Never Heard Of, she said, I talked to Thomas Nelson, and they said, please don't use the word channeling. And this secular reporter said, it's kind of hard not to. And then they made mention of the fact they're removing material from the book. Another thing that was in the original book that I read, and there for nine years until my book came out, was uh, the night of his birth. Jesus says that he was, the Jesus of Jesus calling, says he was born under appalling conditions in a filthy stable. That was a dark night for me. I told my wife, I said, He's hardly out of the womb and he's complaining already? Does that, sound, <laughs> does, that, does that sound like our Lord and Savior? I don't think so. Philippians makes it clear that we're to be content in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, and that's inspired by our Lord and Savior. Another, and, oh, by the way, in the, the 10th anniversary edition that just came out you know, in the last year or so, it was a dark night for me. Gone. Gone. No explanation, nothing. And nobody seems to care. I have yet to see one major Christian leader endorse this book. I have yet to see one major Christian leader critique this book. You've got a bunch of us 
kind of like discernment nobodies out there going, watch out for this book, it's really dangerous. Another one, Jesus of Jesus Calling says, uh, the future is a phantom seeking to spook you. Laugh at the future. Laugh at the future? Anybody turn on the news this that sounds like Rodney Howard Brown, the Toronto Revival. Laugh at the future. And by the way, Rodney Howard Brown is in Washington, D.C. in a week for a 4th of July revival at Constitution Hall. Last year, Rodney Howard Brown, by the way, the Holy Ghost bartender for maybe for you younger people, he had this huge thing up in Toronto where he would just walk around and, and he would just like basically just lay hands on people and they would crack up into holy laughter, so-called, fall to the floor, some of them would bark like dogs. It was at the vineyard up there at the Toronto Vineyard. And that sort of went wild with hardly anybody critiquing it or talking about it. And Rodney Howard Brown is at the head of the line for this new revival. Are we going to believe it's a real revival from God when Rodney Howard Brown and Benny Hinn and some of these guys are joining hands with Rick Warren and maybe President Obama and, and maybe you know some other Christian figures will join in and give it credibility because they have a a more respected name, and somehow we're to believe that this is really from God when we're not even addressing the fact that people like Oprah Winfrey are blaspheming the Lord. Now, she didn't say a slain Christ has no meaning on her TV show. We've actually got clips where she says to some of these New Age people, I can't air this program right now. You're too far ahead of the curve. My people aren't ready for that yet. We're being manipulated, and for some reason or another, Major Christian leaders don't seem to want to deal with this. They're more interested in kind of like, hey, you know, like right now, there's a whole bunch of pastors in Sacramento that have joined together in unity. Unity's a good thing if unity's in truth, but if it's a compromised unity, forget it. Sacramento, by the way, is in the I-5 corridor coming down from Reading, where Bethel Church has been going wild. And Bethel Church and Bill Johnson and Jesus Culture are grabbing the attention of a lot of our youth. There's an experience that goes on with a lot of these things. People want a word from God rather than the word of God. That's where it's at. Have you had a spiritual encounter with Jesus lately? You haven't? Everything okay at home? You having trouble at work? I mean, there's pressure. It's like the old thing, you know, like, do you speak in tongues? You don't? You know, these questions that immediately divide. You know, are you King James only? I've been asked that. I say I've only read the King James. And, and I didn't have any reason to leave it, but I'm not, you know, everybody's got to make up their own mind about these things. But the church has been divided up, and now we're being brought together by kind of like the CEO of the apostate church, Rick Warren. I mean, he, I just read he's going to be getting together with the Pope when he comes into Boston. I've got three quotes from the Catechism 1994, Vatican II, where basically the Catholic Church is saying, you know, now that you're a Christian, you're Christ. You know, God became man so that man could become God. And we're being told, hey, we got everything in common with the Catholic Church. I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. I'm sure Brent could give you a, a whole hour or more on why we are not, you know, have these things in common with the church. How about this one in Jesus Calling? Jesus of Jesus Calling said that Abraham, Father Abraham, was a sun worshiper, S-O-N worshiper. He was a man of undisciplined emotions, and he was an idolater. Well, somebody at Thomas Nelson must have said, you know, I don't know if that one's going to fly. I'm surprised it's lasted nine years. You know, we better get that out of there. So what they did is they cut and pasted, have many of the same words, and they popped in Jacob and Joseph. A little more palatable because, you know, Jacob had a, you know, a sort of a, a little preference for however you want to read that, but they th thought that was more palatable. It's the most amateurish cutting and pasting that you could ever imagine, yet this is a book that has captured just about everybody's attention. I get emails from people saying, thanks for your book, Warren. I threw Jesus Calling away. Next one. I tried to give your book to my friend. She said, why doesn't Warren Smith get a life? He's demonic. People get really rattled because there's a spirit involved with this book. The Jesus of Jesus Calling told Sarah Young, you need to learn to be able to discern what is my voice and what is not. Ask my spirit to give you that discernment. Wait a minute. If that's an unholy spirit, a false Christ, that she's listening to, you don't ask his spirit. That's not 1 John 4.1. 1. 
sorry, you know, that's not the test of the spirits. Um, I don't want to belabor this, but I, I really want you to have a firm understanding about this book so that when somebody tries to give it to you or one of your relatives is reading it, you don't just go, oh, you know, it's, uh, this is serious stuff. And what they do is they're entertaining a spirit, and that spirit starts, like one woman who left Jesus Calling, the book, said that when she was reading Jesus Calling, she felt like, quote, unquote, Jesus was going with her to the grocery store, to church, was sitting next to her, and she said when she stopped, it left. I mean, this is a spirit that makes you feel good about that Jesus, and it's a baby step, baby step, baby step into the false Christ. And there's many of these things going on, and that's why we had a conference, because you, you need that much time. And I don't want to get you confused, but I want you to know how serious this is. Listen to what the Jesus of Jesus Calling tells Sarah Young. Let me control your mind. Does that sound like our Lord and Savior? My main work is to clear out debris and clutter, making room for my spirit to take full possession. That's pretty scary. If that's not Jesus, and I contend clearly that it's not, this, this Jesus wants to take full possession. Come to me with your defenses down. Wait a second. Aren't we told to put on the full armor of God? Come to me with your defenses down. It just goes on and on. There's flattery. The Bible is full of warnings, including, you know, Antichrist comes in by flattery. What more flatterous, that's a word, statement could be put out there that you are Christ, you are God. I was told by the Jesus of A Course in Miracles, he was asked, are you the Christ? And he said, oh yes, along with you. We're all Christ. Listen to what Jesus tells Sarah Young and her millions of readers. When you trustingly whisper my name, my aching ears are soothed. My aching ears are soothed? When you walk through a day in trusting dependence on me, my aching heart is soothed. When your joy in me meets my joy in you, there are fireworks of heavenly ecstasy. Folks, these things wouldn't make it onto a Hallmark card. I mean, the, the, this is just, this is not our Lord and Savior. But there is such a seductive feeling that comes with this thing. And, and I'm reading them in a row, but when they're sandwiched with Scripture, there's a lot of Scripture in there. Matter of fact, when I read her book the first time, there was just scriptural references at the bottom of the page. Now that they're trying to kind of build this book up and defend it against critics, which aren't too many, um, now they've got all the scriptures written out. And I praise God for that, because at least people that are reading the book are starting to get the scripture written out. Rick Warren did that in The Purpose Driven Life. He, he had a scripture, and then you had to go to the back of the book to see what it was. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, belabor this, but um, I want to give you one in particular that um, is, is really serious because it's a direct contradiction uh, of what's in the Bible. The Jesus of Jesus Calling says, I am with you always. These are the last words I spoke before I ascended into heaven. And uh, Matthew 28, 16, and 20 are given as reference. That was on the mountain Galilee. I didn't catch this. My friend Steve, I said, Steve, you've got to read this book. It's filled with stuff. And he called me a week later. He said, hey, did you catch that thing about the contradiction? And I am with you always. I said, no, where was that? I missed that. He said, well, the last words that Jesus spoke were in Acts 1, you know, uh, 8, when he was taken up. And he said, you will be my witnesses. And he was taken up into a cloud. And then they returned from the Mount of Olives. I said, wow, that's interesting. So I got that into my book, 10th anniversary edition of Jesus Calling, gone. No longer the last thing he said before he ascended into heaven. Now it's after my resurrection. There are clever people in publishing houses that are no longer owned by Christians, but are part of like Harper Collins and Rupert Murdoch and whatever. They want to make the money. They've got a huge bestseller here. I'm not ascribing any evil motive to Sarah Young other than the fact that she's changing things and she should be honest about it. I think that she really believes she's hearing from Jesus just as I did when I was in the Course of Miracles and in the New Age. And the things that I was reading were from Jesus. So that, to me, is one of the most dangerous things that's coming into the church. There's many other things. I've got 20 major concerns that I've listed in my book about Jesus Calling. And I, did, I started the book by documenting 10 concerns about the book God Calling, which she said inspired her. One other thing that troubled me deeply 
was that in her original introduction that was there for nine years until my book came out, was that she took a moonlight walk and she said a spirit, spiritual presence enveloped her, surrounded her, and it felt so good. And she said, sweet Jesus. And she said, wow, I never said that before. That must be the voice of my converted heart. That was her conversion in that book for nine years. My book came out and said, you know, that's not exactly a typical Christian conversion. <laughs> How do we know that that presence was, and when you look at what the presence told her, it wasn't Jesus. Well, now in her new introduction, she's tamed that down. It no longer enveloped her. And the paragraph, two paragraphs before that, she got saved. She got saved before she took the moonlight walk. Now, I'm not going to question that. I mean, I'll let that sit. My question is, why wasn't that important enough to put in the first book? That was her conversion. She's talking to everybody and telling about this presence, this experience that she had. People want a word from God. They don't want the word of God. Worse yet, people don't know the word of God, so they're susceptible to a word from God. It makes people feel good. And how else is a church going to get deceived if it's not, it's not going to get deceived by an authoritative Bible because Acts 17, 11, the Bereans measured everything by the word of God to see if these things were so. That's all I did in my book. I don't offer you my opinion. I just say, look, this is what scripture says. This is what she's saying her Jesus said. So Sarah Young is clearly into the experiential mode, and she's a woman who has a number of physical health problems. So it's kind of convenient because you can't get to her. You can't interview her. Anything that she does, and she doesn't do much, is done through email through her editors. It's almost like um, one friend of mine said, um, it's like, oh, well, she was down in uh, Australia doing missionary work, and then when all this stuff kind of hit, she went to Nashville. She moved back to Nashville. That's where Thomas Nelson is. And my friend said, I think they got her in a safe house somewhere in Nashville. You know, it's like... I mean, it's not funny, but it's like they, I think they're worried that if she gets out there, she might just blow it and say something. It's all going on. You know, David Jeremiah in 1995 had a book called Invasion of Other Gods. He said the New Age worldview is the most dangerous worldview threatening the church today. We need people to stand at the bastions of the church to protect people and to expose this. He doesn't talk about it anymore. He's got probably... With all due respect to David Jeremiah, he's probably got six books on the end days down at Barnes & Noble where I live. And he's got one that just came out where he said, I never thought I'd see the day. There's nothing about the New Age, nothing about any of this. As a matter of fact, he cites some very problematic things like the message and a man named Leonard Sweet who is really, um, for all intents and purposes, a New Age sympathizer within the church. And David Jeremiah calls him theologian Leonard Sweet. Roma Downey. She's a New Ager. Uh, my friend Greg Reed re wrote a booklet that you can get online called Confused by an Angel. She's come into the, she's, yeah, he's, he's, the, article, the article is really well documented. Roma Downey's a New Ager. And yet there she is with all these movies, Son of God, and this AD series, and David Jeremiah helped to write the book. No warnings about Roma Downey, the very thing that he warned about before. He said in 1995, Dr. Bernie Siegel is a New Age doctor who has a spirit guide named George. He said, you'd be amazed where his name shows up. It shows up everywhere. You can be on an airline. It'll show up in the magazine. Well, David Jeremiah recommends Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. In my book, Deceived on Purpose, which I've got out there in the hallway, I said, Rick Warren introduces hope and purpose by quoting Dr. Bernie Siegel, who has a spirit guide named George. I can't explain this, folks, and I'm not here to, 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 to be um, unfair to Dr. Jeremiah, but I have to ask the question, what happened? If you continue in my word, Romans 8.31, then you're my disciples indeed. I think we have a lot of Christian leaders who are just backing off. I have uh, a contact in uh, California where he was asked, uh, he told me that a man, pastor, that was asked if he wanted to have a discernment con uh, conference, and he said, oh, no, they're too controversial. My, I, I'll lose people. I, I, I don't know what the motive is for Dr. Jeremiah, but he's not warning about these things anymore. When he said it was the most serious, the New Age was the most serious worldview to enter the church, 
What you've got now is you've got some isolated, kind of unknown discernment people like myself, uh, you know, uh, some of the people at a conference like Joe Schimmel, Eric Barger, you know, we're, we're not well known. And what's happening in the process is that discernment is being put down. We're, we're being called ODMs. That sounds kind of odious. ODMs, Online Discernment Ministries. And so discernment is being, well, that's negative. It's almost like if you sound the alarm in Zion, you're being called an alarmist. If you expose heresy, you're a heresy hunter. You know, if you critique false teachings, you have a critical spirit. You know, it, it's getting wild. And what I'm feeling is that we've got a Christian leadership that is more intent on giving everybody a good time through contemplative prayer, through revival, than exposing the dangers that are coming up and that are so apparent, I hope, for all of you. And when somebody like Oprah, that was 1992. She's been doing that. She's had almost every New Age author on her program. People have been, just like Chuck said, they've been conditioned. Watch your ads on television. You know, uh, I, I was watching a football game last fall, and there was a, a Gatorade commercial. Michael Jordan is a big basketball star a number of years back in, in the States, and he had the flu, and he was sick. And he was sitting on the bench, and he had a towel over his head. And it was the end of the game, and just seconds were rolling down, and uh, they were down. His team, the Chicago Bulls, were down two points. And all of a sudden, at the last minute, Michael, get in there. Towel comes off. This isn't an ad. This happened. He takes a swig of Gatorade, goes on the court, gets the ball, jump shot, phew, swish. They won the game. On the screen, Gatorade, win from within, win from within. These things are sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle. Um, there was a coffee maker, an espresso coffee maker by, I think it was Illy was the name of the the manufacturer, and it said, it experienced a great awakening. I mean, be careful about what's coming in. You know, there, it's just, Isaiah talked about the enemy coming in like a flood. The Lord's going to raise up a standard, but it might not be through the Christian leadership that you're expecting. It might be through your next door neighbor saying, honey, you better be careful about that book, Jesus Calling. I don't want to talk about that. I, actually, a friend of mine talked to a friend of hers of 25 years and she said, uh, I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about the book that you're reading, Jesus Calling. And she said, don't even go there. I don't want to hear it. Lord, Lord I think, and, and Brent and I were talking about this as we drove up here, I think the Lord is proving his body. Do you love me? Do you care? Or do you just want to feel good? Because if you want to feel good, there's lots of spiritual experiences that will come in from the spirit world, and I can attest they're out there. And you've got a false revival, I believe, that's coming on strong. And you can join that. You can feel real good. And, you know, I forget who said it, but, you know, you can boogie all the way down to the pit if you're not careful. I mean, it's just like this is not something you don't want to just jump into things because somebody tells you that it's a good book or it's a good thing to do. So, you know, the other night after I kind of went through a lot of this, I said there's a great scripture. Um, I guess I'll, I'll read it, or you can turn to it too. Psalm 144. We'll just kind of finish up with that. Let's go down to verse 11. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. The right hand of God is power and authority. Jesus sits on the right hand of God. The right hand of falsehood looks like it's from God, but it's not. We're getting the right hand of God through books like The Shack, Jesus Calling, The Message, Purpose Driven Life. Looks like it's from God, but when you really penetrate in there, and you know, I've got quite a few copies of, um, of Deceived on Purpose, uh, and I really don't want to take them back. So like, if, you don't, if you're interested in reading about not only some of the problems in Rick Warren's book, but how it's come into the church, you know, you can donate something or you can just take a book. You know, if you're really interested, I don't want, you know, price to be some kind of a factor. But I think you'll learn a lot about how this thing entered in through the purpose-driven life, some of the same things I'm talking about. So the other night it was like you go through all this stuff and then what do you do? You know, is everybody just kind of like, well, thanks a lot, Warren. You know, I hope you come back, you know, in about 10 years. You know, it's like... You know, no, we rejoice. 
We're told, you know, when we're persecuted, we're, to, we're, to, we're blessed. We're to leap for joy. Now, we can't just do that naturally, but the Lord's telling us, I've told you these things ahead of time so you won't be offended. You don't want to get upset at your family members. You don't want to get riled up when these things happen. But you want to know what's going on. And you can't just say, that's a bad book. Don't read it. You need to have just enough information about it. That's why we've done these little booklets, two of them on Jesus Calling, in case these things. I mean, I'll, I'll be really surprised if some of you, and the way, the way the Lord works sometimes is maybe next week somebody will give you a copy of Jesus Calling. Or you'll hear that one of your family members really likes reading the book. You don't want to be caught short. You just, and just have a little bit of information. For starters, page 199, the Jesus of Jesus Calling says, I am above all as well as in all, the game changer, the thing that's going to turn everything upside down, the leaven, the lie of Second Thessalonians. So I was evangelizing for this false Christ and didn't even know it. I thought it was the real Jesus Christ, and now he's come into the church, and we're well on the way. And again, this weekend, the, things, the events of this weekend are very sobering, and it probably won't be that long before we have some of these events happening within our own countries, and then people are going to get really scared, they're going to look to their Christian leaders, and then we're going to be told, we need revival. No, we need truth. Who's the truth? Jesus Christ. The, the, in Revelation, churches were commended for holding fast to the name of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus doesn't mean anything if it's not the right Jesus. David Hawking once said at a conference, there's 50,000 Jesuses down in Mexico. You know, and that's true. So when, he, when, when the Lord is commending people for holding fast to his name, it's Jesus Christ who died on the cross of Calvary, not the slain Christ who has no meaning, not the Jesus of the shack who said that, he, that God dwells in and around and through all things. Jesus is being redefined. And it's pretty amazing the way that it's happening, and it's pretty slick. Rick Warren said, it helps to know that Satan is predictable. Well, that's real helpful. That's real helpful. That's like a hockey coach saying, ah, oh, we got these guys licked. We don't have to, do, we don't have to worry about defense or anything. Just, just go out there and play. Where did Rick Warren get that? He probably got it from Robert Schuler, who said, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will never have to worry about the devil. Well, thanks, Robert. You know, come on. All of, this, all of this Rick Warren stuff, he, I documented in my book, he's a disciple of Robert Schuller, and we have tons of pastors that came under Schuller's tutelage. Schuller is now deceased, he's, he's gone, but his legacy lives on through all these people who bought into the Schullerization, if you will, of Christianity. So we are to rejoice always, but we're also told to, to, to watch, be careful, um, to be sober, be vigilant. So I really appreciate your attention. I think that's probably enough for today. Hopefully that's not too much. And uh, feel free to email me, uh, warren at mountainstreampress.org, if you have any questions about anything. And I will be out in the lobby for a little while just if you have any questions. And thank you for having me.